Hi friends, welcome back to my reading of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. We're going to continue today with chapter 9. Chapter 9, Grandpa Joe Takes a Gamble. The next day, when Charlie came home from school and went in to see his grandparents, he found that only Grandpa Joe was awake. The other three were all snoring loudly. Shh, whispered Grandpa Joe, and he beckoned Charlie to come closer. Charlie tiptoed over and stood beside the bed. The old man gave Charlie a sly grin, and then he started rummaging under his pillow with one hand, and when the hand came out again, there was an ancient leather purse clutched in the fingers. Under cover of the bedclothes, the old man opened the purse and tipped it upside down. Out fell a single silver sixpence it's my secret hoard he whispered the others don't know i've got it and now you and i are going to have one more fling at finding that last ticket how about it huh but you'll have to help me are you sure you want to spend your money on that grandpa charlie whispered of course i'm sure spluttered the old man excitedly don't stand there arguing i'm as keen as you are to find that ticket here Take the money and run down the street to the nearest shop and buy the first Wonka bar you see and bring it straight back to me, and we'll open it together. Charlie took the little silver coin and slipped quickly out of the room. In five minutes, he was back. Have you got it? whispered Grandpa Joe, his eyes shining with excitement. Charlie nodded and held out the bar of chocolate. Wonka's nutty crunch surprise, it said on the wrapper. Good, the old man whispered, sitting up on in the bed and rubbing his hands. Now, come over here and sit close to me and we'll open it together. Are you ready? Yes, Charlie said. I'm ready. All right, you tear off the first bit. No, Charlie said. You paid for it. You do it all. The old man's fingers were trembling most terribly as they fumbled with the wrapper. We don't have a hope, really, he whispered, giggling a little bit. You do know we don't have a hope, don't you? Yes, Charlie said. I know that. They looked at each other and both started giggling nervously. Mind you, said Grandpa Joe, there is just that teeny chance that it might be the one. Don't you agree? Yes, Charlie said. Of course. Why don't you open it, Grandpa? All in good time, my boy. All in good time. Which end do you think I ought to open first? That corner. The one furthest from you. Just tear off a tiny bit, but not quite enough for us to see anything. Like that, said the old man. Yes. Now a little bit more. You finish it, said Grandpa Joe. I'm too nervous. No, Grandpa, you must do it yourself. Very well, then. Here goes. He tore off the wrapper. They both stared at what lay underneath. It was a bar of chocolate. Nothing more. All at once, they both saw the funny side of the whole thing, and they burst into peals of laughter. What on earth's going on? cried Grandma Josephine, waking up suddenly. Nothing, said Grandpa Joe. You go on back to sleep. Chapter 10. The Family Begins to Starve During the next two weeks, the weather turned very cold. First came the snow. It began very suddenly one morning, just as Charlie Bucket was getting dressed for school. Standing by the window, he saw the huge flakes drifting slowly down out of an icy sky that was the color of steel. By evening, it lay four feet deep around the tiny house, and Mr. Bucket had to dig a path from the front door to the road. After the snow, there came a freezing gale that blew for days and days without stopping, and oh, how bitter cold it was! Everything that Charlie touched seemed to be made of ice, and each time he stepped outside the door, the wind was like a knife on his cheek. Inside the house, little jets of freezing air came rushing in through the sides of the windows and under the doors, and there was no place to go to escape them. The four old ones lay silent and huddled in their bed, trying to keep the cold out of their bones. The excitement over the golden tickets had long since been forgotten. Nobody in the family gave a thought now to anything except the two vital problems of trying to keep warm and trying to get enough to eat. There is something about very cold weather that gives one an enormous appetite. Most of us find ourselves beginning to crave rich steaming stews and hot apple pies and all kinds of delicious warming dishes. 
and because we are all a great deal luckier than we realize, we usually get what we want, or near enough. But Charlie Bucket never got what he wanted because the family couldn't afford it, and as the cold weather went on and on, he became ravenously and desperately hungry. Both bars of chocolate, the birthday one and the one Grandpa Joe had bought, had long since been nibbled away, and all he got now were those thin, cabbagey meals three times a day. Then, all at once, the meals became even thinner. The reason for this was that the toothpaste factory, the place where Mr. Bucket worked, suddenly went bust and had to close down. Quickly, Mr. Bucket tried to get another job, but he had no luck. In the end, the only way in which he managed to earn a few pennies was by shoveling snow in the streets. But it wasn't enough to buy even a quarter of the food that seven people needed. The situation became desperate. Breakfast was a single slice of bread for each person now, and lunch was maybe half a boiled potato. Slowly but surely, everybody in the house began to starve. And every day, little Charlie Bucket, trudging through the snow on his way to school, would have to pass Mr. Willy Wonka's giant chocolate factory. And every day as he came near to it, he would lift his small pointed nose high in the air and sniff the wonderful sweet smell of melting chocolate. Sometimes he would stand motionless outside the gates for several minutes on end, taking deep swallowing breaths as though he were trying to eat the smell itself. That child, said Grandpa Joe, poking his head up from under the blanket one icy morning, that child has got to have more food. Doesn't matter about us. We're too old to bother with. But a growing boy? He can't go on like this. He's beginning to look like a skeleton. What can one do? murmured Grandma Josephine miserably. He refuses to take any of ours. I hear his mother try to slip her own piece of bread onto his plate at breakfast this morning, but he wouldn't touch it. He made her take it back. He's a fine little fellow, said Grandpa George. He deserves better than this. The cruel weather went on and on, and every day Charlie Bucket grew thinner and thinner. His face became frighteningly white and pinched. The skin was drawn so tightly over the cheeks that you could see the shapes of his bones underneath. It seemed doubtful whether he could go on much longer like this without becoming dangerously ill. And now, very calmly, with what curious wisdom that seems to come so often to small children in times of hardship, he began to make little changes here and there in some of the things that he did so as to save his strength. In the mornings, he left the house ten minutes earlier so that he could walk slowly to school without ever having to run. He sat quietly in the classroom during break, resting himself, while the others rushed outdoors and threw snowballs and wrestled in the snow. Everything he did now, he did slowly and carefully, to prevent exhaustion. Then, one afternoon, walking back home with the icy wind in his face, and incidentally feeling hungrier than he had ever felt before, his eye had caught suddenly by something silvery lying in the gutter, in the snow. Charlie stepped off the curb and bent down to examine it. Part of it was buried under the snow, but he saw at once what it was. It was a 50 pence piece. Quickly, he looked around him. Had somebody just dropped it? No, that was impossible because of the way it was buried. Several people were hurrying past him on the pavement. Their chins sunk deep in their collars of their coats, their feet crunching in the snow. None of them was searching for any money. None of them was taking the slightest notice of the small boy crouching in the gutter. Then was it his? This 50 pence? Could he have it? Carefully, Charlie pulled it out from under the snow. It was damp and dirty, but otherwise perfect. A whole 50 pence! He held it tightly between his shivering fingers, gazing down at it. It meant one thing to him at that moment. Only one thing. It meant food. Automatically, Charlie turned and began moving towards the nearest shop. It was only ten paces away. It was a newspaper and stationery shop, the kind that sells almost everything, including sweets and cigars. And what he would do, he whispered quickly to himself, he would buy one luscious bar of chocolate and eat it all up, every bit of it 
right then and there, and the rest of the money he would take straight back home and give to his mother. Chapter 11 The Miracle Charlie entered the shop and laid the damp 50 pence on the counter. One Wonka's whipple scrumptious fudge mellow delight, he said, remembering how much he had loved the one he had on his birthday. The man behind the counter looked fat and well-fed. He had big lips and fat cheeks and a very fat neck. The fat around his neck bulged out all around the top of his collar like a rubber ring. He turned and reached behind him for the chocolate bar. Then he turned back again and handed it to Charlie. Charlie grabbed it and quickly tore off the wrapper and took an enormous bite. Then he took another, and another, and oh, the joy of being able to cram large pieces of something sweet and solid into one's mouth. The sheer blissful joy of being able to fill one's mouth with rich, solid food. You look like you wanted that one, Sonny, the shopkeeper said pleasantly. Charlie nodded, his mouth bulging with chocolate. The shopkeeper put Charlie's change on the counter. Take it easy, he said. It'll give you a tummy ache if you swallow it like that without chewing. Charlie went on wolfing the chocolate. He couldn't stop, and in less than half a minute, the whole thing had disappeared down his throat. He was quite out of breath, but he felt marvelously, extraordinarily happy. He reached out a hand to take the change. Then he paused. His eyes were just above the level of the counter. They were staring at the silver coins lying there. The coins were all five penny pieces. There were nine of them all together. Surely it wouldn't matter if he spent just one more. I think, he said quietly, I think I'll have just one more of those chocolate bars. The same kind as before, please. Why not? The fat shopkeeper said, reaching behind him again and taking another whipple scrumptious fudge mellow delight from the shelf. He laid it on the counter. Charlie picked it up and tore off the wrapper, and suddenly, from underneath the wrapper, there came a brilliant flash of gold. Charlie's heart stood still. It's a golden ticket, screamed the shopkeeper, leaping about a foot in the air. You've got a golden ticket. You found the last golden ticket. Hey, would you believe it? Come and look at this, everybody. The kids found Wonka's last golden ticket. There it is. It's right here in his hands. It seemed as though the shopkeeper might be going to have a fit. In my shop, too, he yelled. He found it right here in my own little shop. Somebody call the newspapers quick and let them know. Watch out now, Sonny. Don't tear it as you unwrap it. That thing's precious. In a few seconds, there was a crowd of about 20 people clustering around Charlie, and many more were pushing their way in from the street. Everybody wanted to get a look at the golden ticket and at the lucky finder. Where is it? Somebody shouted. Hold it up so all of us can see it. There it is, there, someone else shouted. He's holding it in his hands. See the gold shining? How did he manage to find it, I'd like to know, a large boy shouted angrily. Twenty bars a day I've been buying for weeks and weeks. Think of all the free stuff he'll be getting too, another boy said enviously. A lifetime supply. He'll need it, the skinny little shrimp, a girl said, laughing. Charlie hadn't moved. He hadn't even unwrapped the golden ticket from around the chocolate. He was standing very still, holding it tightly with both hands, while the crowd pushed and shouted all around him. He felt quite dizzy. There was a peculiar floating sensation coming over him, as though he were floating up in the air like a balloon. His feet didn't seem to be touching the ground at all. He could hear his heart thumping away loudly somewhere in his throat. At that point, he became aware of a hand resting lightly on his shoulder, and when he looked up, he saw a tall man standing over him. Listen, the man whispered. I'll buy it from you. I'll give you 50 pounds. How about it, huh? And I'll give you a new bicycle as well, okay? Are you crazy? shouted a woman who was standing equally close. Why, I'd give him 200 pounds for that ticket. You want to sell that ticket for 200 pounds, young man? That's quite enough of that, the shopkeeper shouted, pushing his way through the crowd and taking Charlie firmly by the arm. Leave the kid alone, will you? Make way there. Let him out. And to Charlie, as he led him to the door, he whispered, don't you let anybody have it. Take it straight home quickly before you lose it. Run all the way, and don't stop till you get there. You understand? Charlie nodded. You know something, the shopkeeper said, pausing a moment and smiling at Charlie. I have a feeling you needed a break like this. I'm awfully glad you got it. Good luck to you, Sonny. 
Thank you, Charlie said, and off he went, running through the snow as fast as his legs would go. And as he flew past Mr. Willy Wonka's factory, he turned and waved at it and sang out, I'll be seeing you. I'll be seeing you soon. And five minutes later, he arrived at his own home. Tomorrow will continue with chapter 12.